Good morning. Happy Easter. Happy Easter. Welcome to Church of the Foothills. My name is Nathan Hill. I'm the pastor here, and I just want to welcome you, whether you're here in person or worshiping with us online on a day of transformation, of new beginnings, a day of possibilities. We welcome you and want you to make yourself at home, especially if you're a guest with us for the first time. Know that the love of God abounds in this place and in this community. Please note that at, at some point in the service, a, a little booklet will be passed down. You can put your contact information if you'd like to be on our email list or just like us to pray for you or support you in any way we can. You can pass that on and we'll pick those up at the end of service and, and reach out to you as you feel comfortable. You'll also see cards and, and ways for you to share prayer concerns or, or to give and support the ministry that goes on each and every week here at Church of the Foothills. And, and note that in our, we have our bulletin. There's going to be a few adjustments today in the service as we go along, a few edits. So just go with the flow today <laughs> and be open to the Spirit moving in this place. I'm going to invite us now to center ourselves and worship and invite Sammy to lead us as we begin singing and praising God together. join me in these words that call us together. The tomb is empty. Christ is risen. The soldiers have returned home. Christ is risen. The anger of the crowd is gone. Christ is risen. The time of grieving has ended. Christ is risen. Violence, fear, and death have disappeared. Christ is risen. Come, let us go to the house of the Lord. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. We now invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You. <laughs> <laughs> we 
We now invite you to stand as you're able and join in singing Joyful, Joyful, We Adore You, number four in New Century Hymnal. may be seated. Let's go ahead. We've been standing a long time. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Indeed. There we go. Okay, now I'm going to trust you. Christos Aneste. Oh, who have, oh, there we go. My whole, my whole Greek class, he started with Christ is risen. Christos Aneste. And we learned to answer. What do we answer, Bill? Alathosineste. Well, let's try this here. So, Alathosineste. Try that. Alathosineste. All right. Christosineste. There you go. You say you learned Greek in church today. We are here. We are joy. We are filled. We are that love, that joy, that peace, that energy that Christ brought, that Christ shared, that Christ rose and brought to us today. That is what we are celebrating. I see nothing but smiles. I hope you are smiling in your heart. I hope you are smiling in your life, that you're feeling that joy, you're bringing that joy, you are that joy, and if you're not, it's okay because we can give that to God and feel that love and compassion and joy come back to us. So with that joy of Easter, that passion that Christ is risen, let us be quiet also in our celebration. Because even though the joy of Easter is everywhere, God will still and always continue to talk to us in a still, soft voice. Wherever you are this Easter morning, I invite you to center yourselves, to open your hearts, open yourself to God, and let's take just a moment and listen and then I will continue in prayer. Let us be quiet. Gracious, loving Lord, 
creator of us all, on this beautiful Easter morning, we say thank you. We sing joys and praises that Christ is risen and in our lives and full and share. Help us to be the vessels this day to bring that joy in our world. Emulate all that he stood for, all that he taught us. And in our hearts, we know you're there, listening, watching, looking, and active. We give them to you on this Easter morning. Hopefully, they are full and strong and full of joy, ready to receive and be that radiant energy. But maybe we come to this safe place, to this sacred place, to this place where we know we are loved, to this place where there is family, and our hearts might be heavy, our hearts might be hurting, and we know this is a place for us because we give those heavy and hurting hearts to you, dear God, in our family, in our safe place, and we ask for you to fill them. We ask for the light, for the guidance, for the road that we, while we watch Jesus walk and he rose above it, help us be that. Lighten our paths in the ways we need them lightened. Give us direction, give us hope, and let us feel the joy that we feel on this day because Christ has risen and he has risen indeed. Amen. You may remain seated as we sing your everlasting love, number 22 in Chalice Praise.
I wonder if it was raining on that first Easter morning and Jesus was as ambivalent about coming out of the tomb as we were about standing to sing. <laughs> Pretty sure it wasn't snow. A reading of Easter from the Gospel of Mark. When the Sabbath was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, brought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun has, had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? When they looked up, they saw that the stone, which was very large, had already been rolled back. As they entered the tomb, they saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. They said to them, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there is the place they laid him. But go, tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. Just there you will see him as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb. For terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us, thanks be to God.
before we have any music, I invite our young people to come on forward. I invite our young folks. Dom, Dom, stay here with me for a minute. Come sit down for a second. We haven't done this for a while. It's a special day. Come on up. Come on up. All right. Come on up. All right. Good morning. How y'all doing? Good. Oh, wow. Oh, there you go. You're all taller than the last time we sat up here. All right. Why is today special? Because it's Easter. It's Easter. What's special about Easter? Because a long time ago, this on this day, um, people found out that Jesus had risen from his tomb. I love it. People found that Jesus risen from his tomb. Anyone else? What's, what's today? Liam, you got anything? I see you thinking. Hmm. Wheels are going. So we talk about new life today. I see some bunny ears. I, don't know, I still haven't worked out bunny ears and, and, the, and the tomb. We're going to work on that one. Maybe that's part. But, oh, oh, hold on here. What? We have assistance of the Easter bunny. And who does not need assistance from the Easter bunny? I mean, there you go. We talk about new life and joy and love and sharing. And in our Sunday school classes, in our worship and wonder, we talk about symbols and metaphors and meaning. So let me see you guys' eyes. Let me see up here. I see. I see the light, the love, the joy in your eyes. The joy. I saw, do you see joy? Just for that glimpse, you see joy? Folks, share that. Be that. Be that in your lives, in your faith, with God. Can you be that joy? Yeah. We're going to, this. so our Be Still and Know Your God has been our song for Lent and Easter. We're going to do it one more time today, and then next week we're actually going to change our song. So everyone stand up, get up here on the steps, and one last time, join with me in the congregation. Dom, will you get our light? And Joaquin, you two together. And let's look at everybody. We're going we're gonna to sing Be Still with the congregation. So everyone look on out. And John, if you would, please. One of the games I play with our preschool kids right here at Foothills Preschool that is an important part of our ministry and connection to the community involves the tall slide that you see on your screen there. Once a week or so I walk out and as the kids have gathered and out there playing and enjoying the sunlight and enjoying the playground, I see at least one of them will be climbing to the top of that structure and and about to go down the slide, and I run out and I say, kids, wait, no, 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 wait. I, I, I have to, I, I need to put up a sign that the, the, the slide is out of order. And they're like, what are you talking about, Pastor Nathan? And I said, it's just, the slide, it's too tall, it's too dangerous, it's too scary. If you go down it, you'll go at the speed of light, and then we'll have to call an ambulance and the fire department to come and save you. And the kids at first like take me seriously and then as I, you know, as they listen to me and knowing that they have gone down this slide a hundred times already, you know, even that day probably, they realize I'm, I'm being a little silly and they begin to crack a smile and they look at me and they say, look, well, nah, uh Pastor Nathan, and they start to get to the edge of that slide and they're looking me right in the eye, and I'm like, no, no, don't go, don't go, it's too dangerous. And then they go zipping down the slide. 
in delight with a giggle and a laugh. And then what happens is it grows. And then it's not just one preschooler. It's two, three, five, ten, fifteen. They all start lining up and they're like, look at me, Pastor Nathan. I'm like, no, no, no. And they zip down the slide and they're all giggling and laughing and full of joy, pushing boundaries. Just Friday, on Good Friday, I played this game with the kids, and one of the little girls looked at me, and I said, no, and then she went down the slide, and she came down, and I said, I said, it's too scary. Why did you go down the slide? And she looked at me, and she said, I'm not scared. I'm brave. <laughs> hmm. In that interaction, those preschool kids show something that I can, I have, and can think about in my life, lost at points. Now, granted, the slide is a playground slide, and if there's any prospective parents, it is a safe slide, right? You know, I just want to be clear about that. But something happens to us adults, parents, grandparents, to those of us who have ended up going into our world around us, and we start worrying about things as we get older like liability, <laughs> hospital visits, health care, our bodies, safety over risk. We can often find ourselves very afraid by what this world does to us. And sure enough, there are many reasons to be afraid. Fear, after all, can be a lifesaver in our lives. I've never met anyone who wasn't at least a little afraid before going into surgery or getting on to, into the Ghost Rider roller coaster at Knott's Berry Farm. Like, if you're not a little nervous, something's probably wrong with you. But fear in our lives can, also, can almost limit us. Our author Cole Arthur Riley in her book, This Here Flesh, suggests that when we experience trauma, when we are afraid, when our world is shaking, shaken, fear can get transplanted down into our very bones. It lives with us. It can deprive our world of magic and wonder. Fear can tempt us to withdraw into our little shells, shying away from those moments, relationships, and opportunities in our lives that might draw us out into new possibilities, into love. So when I play that game with our preschool kids, they remind me of those times in my life when I felt fearless, when I enjoyed pushing boundaries, going past what others might say is risky, when I was told by an adult to stay in my little box, and not experience the wonder of the world. Now some of you may be thinking, Pastor, why? it's Easter. Why are we talking about fear on a day like this? But, but didn't you hear the Gospel of Mark and how it ended? It ends with fear. And that's kind of a problem on a day like this. Shouldn't the Gospel be about liberation and hope and healing and all that fun stuff and new life? Shouldn't it be about brass ensembles? Right? And dynamic choirs and stylish Easter outfits and hats, Melody. I see your hat. <laughs> and bright, sunny days, and it's raining today, which makes that all, you know. That's what Easter should be about. But, but the gospel ends on that first Easter 2,000 plus years ago with fear. The women went away. They didn't tell anybody what they had experienced because they were afraid. What a terrible ending to a, a good story. This doesn't sound like good news. You know, the Gospel of, of Mark introduces us to this compelling person named Jesus who gathered around him a ragtag group of disciples and spoke a message and lived a message of liberation. Who called people to repentance. He healed and taught and loved those who were at the edges of society. For his disciples in first century Jewish faith, they saw in him a ministry of, of God's ancient promises coming to be fulfilled. A Messiah, a leader to lead the people into a new future. 
his story was not supposed to end like this. Not supposed to end in fear. Not supposed to end with his arrest. Not supposed to end with his torture. Not supposed to end with his disciples betraying him and fleeing him and abandoning him in his moment of need. It was not supposed to end with his painful, humiliating death by the Roman Empire on a cross. It was not supposed to end in a tomb with a heavy stone sealed shut, so heavy that the women that morning wondered, how are we going to be able to honor the body of our beloved one? How are we going to move this stone? It was not supposed to end with the women after being told by the messenger, the angel there, do not be afraid, it was not supposed to end in terror and amazement. Afraid. Speak what they had just experienced to anyone. And we're not alone, maybe, in thinking this gospel story ends poorly because if you look at your Bibles, the historic church wasn't happy either. They didn't like it so much that there are two alternate endings to the gospel of Mark right? There, there, if you look in your Bibles, I invite you, if you have it at home, there's two alternate endings. The short ending, which is sort of like, and they all lived happily ever after, you know, like, which comes from about the fourth century. And then one that, also, that goes to the second century, which kind of remixes some from Luke uh, and Matthew into a more of a, a tacked on ending of what Jesus does next. But the earliest manuscripts ends with this image of the women leaving in silence and in fear. Hanging on the edge of a cliff. Fear. Gosh, what do we do with that? Theologian Amanda Bross Renaud writes, like the end of a movie that has no clear resolution, with everything still hanging in the balance, Mark's audience is meant to be at the edge of their seats, waiting for what comes next. It is disorienting, and I think it is meant to be, she says. Jesus disorients us so that we might be reoriented. Indeed, for the women that day who had come to anoint the body of their beloved, they were full of grief. Their world had already been shattered. And had been shattered in a way that they were all too familiar with, a world that can be violent and painful where oppression and justice and evil have seemed to have the final word once again. The story of Jesus ended, his movement over, the stone rolling over his story to say, this is done. You won't hear from this guy anymore. And now, in the midst of that disorientation, they are disoriented anew when they see the angel that morning an empty tomb. And the angel says, Jesus isn't here. He has risen. And he's going ahead of you. Now they were disoriented in a way that led them to fear and amazement and wonder. They just didn't know what to think of this and what it might mean for their world. Jesus' story wasn't over. Jesus, Jesus, even in a world with trauma and fear laced down into our bones, would continue ahead of us, writing new chapters, new possibilities for liberation, for healing, for hope. It was like that angel was inviting them to go to the edge of that slide and, and, and descend into a new reality. In fact, Cole, Cole Ar- Arthur Riley, who's just this wonderful author, she writes about this. She says, when, she says that phrase, do not be afraid, that the angels often say to people when they show up, and I would be scared if an angel showed up for me. You know. <laughs> she, says, I, she says, I don't interpret that as a command not to fear, but rather the nurturing voice of God drawing near to our trembling. On that Easter morning, God said to those women through this messenger, don't be afraid. A new reality is possible. A new life is possible. A new story is possible. God remains with them. The women did leave. Yes, they were afraid. But we're here today because those women began to share the good news. They didn't just keep it to themselves. They went on to share 
with others in the early Christian community who in turn shared it with others. And even though at first they were frightened and they met in rooms with dark, with, with, with the shades pulled down low and the doors locked because they were afraid, the word could not be contained. The message couldn't be contained and it spread that evil and injustice would never have the final word. Even in the midst of trying and difficult times, resurrection meant we could all be brave. We could all be like that little preschooler and be brave as we face this world in which we live. The Gospel of Mark ends on such a cliffhanger because it leaves the story to us, church, to keep telling and writing new chapters of what resurrection means and what it looks like in a complicated and messy and violent world in which we live. And that fear will never limit us in our possibility. Jesus calls us and embraces us on this day to be like those preschool kids and take that plunge down the slide into resurrection, into possibilities of how life can be when we share and live and model the love of God. And I value, I'm so proud of our church here at Church of the Foothills because I think we are taking steps into that bravery, dreaming of what lies in the future of our community and how we can share God's love with our neighbors in new ways. Whether that's a parenting academy to help parents who have neurodivergent children or need extra support in a changing world or when we go out to the community and take church to the city blocks around us. When we show up for LGBTQ plus neighbors at, at school board meetings, that, they, that those students can be safe. When we hold each other's hands before going back for surgery, these are ways that we invite each other to be brave. And that kind of bravery is possible in your life to find healing where you thought it was impossible. Perhaps to turn in a new direction. To start over. To ask questions that your former religious practices said were out of bounds. Or to discover that you are welcome at this table. And on this trans day of visibility, to live fully into who you are as a beloved child of God. So hear these encouraging words, friends. Whatever it is you are carrying with you, whatever has you anxious and worried about our world and the future, fear will not win. God says, do not be afraid. Be brave. Jesus has risen. Thanks be to God. Amen. We invite you now to celebrate this day by singing Morning Has Broken. Please rise. Chalice hymnal number 53.
Happy Easter, Church of the Foothills. For those of you, my name is Caleb, um, and I got asked this morning to talk a little bit about stewardship. Need a little bit more? There we go. Hey. <laughs> all right, so I got asked this morning to talk a little bit about stewardship, and as I was, first of all, as I was looking out to all of you guys, I see so many colors in the congregation. It's wonderful that it's Easter today, and I'm standing here looking like I'm dressed in the likeness of the stone that rolled away. So um, <laughs> moving forward, um, I wanted to talk about a little bit about God's stewardship towards Jesus. I wanted to keep it a little bit as an Easter theme. So when Christ was in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he was praying, and he said that, Lord, he said, let this cup pass from me, but not my will, but your will. Even though it was very hard for him, stewardship that God showed to him still kept him on track. And as we kind of move down and we move towards even in the upper room, when, you know, he was there and they had their, they had their last dinner and they were celebrating, you know, the Passover, it says in Mark, it says in Mark chapter 14, uh, right around the 28th verse, it talks about a hymn that they sung. And I was wondering, because, you know, music, I love music, I love hearing the choir, I love, you know, being able to sing praises to God. And when I was thinking about what hymns would it be that they would actually be singing in the upper room? And the Passover hymns fall under Psalms 116 through Psalms 118. Psalms 118, we should actually be very familiar with because uh, a couple, a few Sundays ago, it was talking about the stone that the builder rejected became the cornerstone. And so in my mind, understanding that David, when he was writing these Psalms way back when, had no idea that his words were going to be a stewardship to the Son of God himself. And that was something that totally blew my mind. And when we're thinking about how God made all these things happen to be able to allow even Christ to be able to feel stewarded towards his purpose, for us, Christ stewards us almost every single day. It's not just Easter that we as Christians are able to look at the sacrifice and the resurrection that Christ was able to do for us only on one day of the year. It's something that we're able to carry, that we remember whenever we stand before this table, whenever we break that bread, whenever we drink the wine, we know that that resurrection is something that is carried through day by day, week by week, and year by year in our lives. And so something that I also wanted to be able to talk about is uh, our stewardship towards each other. So just that Christ was a steward to us it's important that we're supposed to be stewards to other and others, and it doesn't mean just to other Christians. It doesn't mean just to people who think the same way that we do. It means being a steward to all as Christ was a steward to all. Being a steward to all as God was a steward to Christ. And even on this day of transgender visibility, there was a lot of people that are, were very frustrated whenever you know, they were talking about being able to make this day something that is for trans visibility. But I have a question. The Christ that resurrected, do those people that end up making those, making it really a, a, a big deal when it's really, really a wonderful thing, do they not know that Christ died and resurrected for the oppressed? Do they not know that Christ died and resurrected for those that were persecuted? For those that may think that they, you know, potentially they think that they're less than or they think that they could be more. Christ died for each and every one of us. And that's the beauty of it all. And so I want to say to my transgender brothers and sisters and family that I am proud to be able to see you. That I'm proud to be able to share in your stewardship because Christ's death and resurrection, Christ's stewardship goes to every nation every family, every kindred, every tongue, every language, and every people. And again, I'll say that we don't need one day to be able to worship the son of the God who created every single day. And that's the beauty of us as Christians. That's the beauty of us as a congregation, as of a people, with all like minds to be able to love each other, regardless of where you've come from or regardless of where you're going. That stewardship doesn't end. It didn't end with David. It didn't end with Jesus. And it doesn't end with us. 
It goes on day by day as we live our lives in the best capacity that God would allow us to live them together. So with that, for the honor and glory of God, and thank you so much, and uh, thank you for being a big part of my family. God bless you. We invite you to stand as you're able and join us in singing the first verse of Here I Am, Lord, number 452 in Chalice Hymnal.
Thank you. You may be seated. Beloved, we gather at this table today from many different backgrounds, different faith journeys, different stories, different challenges that are weighing on our hearts. Here we come all as guests to share in these precious gifts that remind us that God goes with us, reminds us of the presence of love here in our midst through these symbols, through our love and our acts of kindness and compassion and care for each other. So wherever you are in your journey, know that you are welcome to receive these gifts, to be invited, to be brave, to be loved, to know the goodness and mercy of our God. So we remember... In the upper room, Jesus took bread, blessed it, and broke it, and said, This is my body shared with you. Take and eat. In like manner, took the cup. A cup, a possibility of new beginnings, of new promises. He said, Take and drink, each of you. Share in my love. And do these things again and again to remember me and to tell my story. Let's bow for a prayer together. Mother, Father, God, we come to this table in celebration, in hope and in joy. We celebrate Jesus, who lives among us still. Jesus, who taught us by word and example to live with purpose and to love indiscriminately. We live in a world that is fractured and hurting. Yet, as we break the bread and sip from the cup in all our individuality and diversity, we are one. Amen. Amen. Who is welcome at this table? All people are welcome. As we invite you forward, please take and share in these elements just as you come forward. You don't need to hold it until we all, you know, t together. And we're going to have two, st two stations because of our wonderful musicians here. Uh, on this side, you'll come forward and come this way. And the other, uh, this side, we'll invite you to go to the back, to the station, so you can wrap around to your seat. So a little bit different today.
Thanks be to God. And again, great to see each and every one of you here today, especially for those of you who may be your first time. Thank you for choosing to worship with us. If you have questions, if you want to learn more about it, you can, of course, check out our website, but also just speak to one of our greeters or elders as we continue our Easter celebration. We always have coffee and goodies over in Davis Hall, which is straight across the courtyard. It does look like the rain has stopped. Um, I've been your pastor for over a year now, and when I moved here, y'all said it never rained, and it is just like it's... (laughs) Okay, well, I, I can't take credit for that, but we're going to continue that time of fellowship. You'll find other ways to, to get connected on the insert in your bulletin. We have some, uh, a new sermon series beginning next Sunday. We have other ways to, to plug in and connect with people and, uh, and live bravely in this time, in this Easter season. Just to note, we are going to have our Easter egg hunt. Uh, we may, it may be indoors to avoid all the wetness, uh, and so uh, I think for our older youth, there probably been opportunity for you to help hide the Easter eggs if you would like to do that. But so if you have a family here and you have little ones, you're welcome to hang out and have some fun for our Easter egg. I think we're going to do it here in the sanctuary and over in Davis Hall just after worship here in a few minutes once we get things set up. Here, this blessing. Do not be afraid. Our Creator is with us. Death and injustice are overcome. Love reaches us, holds us, and sends us out. Let's leave in amazement and share this good news. Go in peace. Amen. First of all, this is, this is my first Easter here, so I'm very excited. Thank you all for the yes, first Easter. We, yes, amen. It has, it has been told to me that a tradition is to sing the Hallelujah Chorus from Handel's Messiah, and that if we have any choir members in the audience who know the Hallelujah Chorus and would like to sing along, we invite you now to come on up. The only thing we ask is that you do not black, uh, bl- block our brass players and Jeff, who is uh, going to be on the timpani. But if we have any other musicians in the house, we invite you now to come on up and come join us. Choir will stand. Can we also give a huge round of applause to our amazing brass quartet? Please rise for the Hallelujah Chorus and Happy Easter to all.
Aleluya, aleluya, aleluya.